Welcome everyone. We'll be waiting two to three minutes to get started as a courtesy to those who are still in the middle of connecting. Welcome everyone, thanks for joining us and thanks for being part of our community. We have a great topic to cover today, but first a few reminders. Please feel free to ask questions at any time by typing them in the IM window. Be aware that any questions you post will be publicly visible. However, if you prefer, you can post your question anonymously by checking the box right below where you enter it. We've had a large number of people register for this webinar. We're thrilled to see such interest, but it means it may be impossible for us to respond to the large volume of questions in real time. We will do our best to get as many as we can, and we have several dedicated people standing by just to answer questions. But I wanted to provide an additional mechanism to ensure everyone's questions get answered. If you'll visit aka.ms slash Azure ATP community, and all these links I'm mentioning here are uh, pasted in the IM window, you'll be able to ask uh, questions on our Azure ATP forum. If you're listening to this after the fact as a recording, that's also a great place to ask a question. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be shared publicly. We will post the recordings on our community at aka.ms slash AATP recordings. While you're there, please join our community by visiting aka.ms slash security community. That's the best way to ensure you don't miss any future webinars or major announcements. On our community, you can speak directly to our engineering teams that create our security products. You'll be able to influence our product designs by getting and get early access to changes by doing things like participating in private previews, requesting features, giving feedback, reviewing our product roadmaps, attending in-person events, or joining webinars like this. We believe that the best way to improve our products is by removing any barriers between you and the people that create them. So we hope you'll join us. We have a fascinating topic for you today. We'll be talking all about Azure Advanced Threat Protection. Specifically, we'll be focusing on detections and alerts. I'd like to introduce you to our presenters. We have Tal Mayor, Tali Ash, and Andrew Harris. They are all members of the Azure ATP engineering team, so they have deep, deep expertise in this topic. Without further ado, I will turn it over to them. Tali. Thank you, Ryan. 
I am Tali Ash, a product manager in the Azure ATP team. The goal of this session is to teach how Kerberos and NTLM work. We will see how attackers are using these protocols to get credentials and move laterally in the domain. There will be a live demo of relevant attack techniques, such as brute force and pass the ticket. And we will see the security alerts Azure ATP triggers. Here you can see the different security alerts Azure ATP provides. Azure ATP covers the different phases of the key chain, from the reconnaissance phase up to the domain dominance. In bold, you can see the attacks we will focus on today, which are based on the authentication protocols. We will go over account enumeration, brute force, pass the ticket, and NTLM relay attack. And I'm forwarding the mic to Tal. Hey everyone, my name is Tal. I'm a security research here at Microsoft, working on the Azure ATP team. And before we get to the NTLM and KBros flow, I'll put some um, reminder about authentication and authorization. While authentication validates the authenticity of a user, the authorization manages what resource an authenticated user may access to. In authentication, we would ask, does the user know its predefined password? In the main environment, uh, with, a piece, uh, with a DC, the predefined password are always stored on the Active Directory DC. Um, in authorization, we would ask, does the account have permissions to ac access a resource? This would be validated by the results the access to. We'll see how it takes place with NTLM and KBros in a few more minutes. Um, before that, let's have a quick comparison, comparison between NTLM and KBros. Well, um, okay, both of uh, the protocols are mostly on-premise um, in, in, in an on-premise environment, but also we can see some of them, some of them in the cloud. Um, while the main co concept of Kerberos is a symmetric key protocol with a third party, party where the client talks to the DC and then the client um, access a server, in NTLM, we have a challenge response um, authentication where the client accesses the server and the server generates the authentication in front of the DC. Or more correctly to say that the server sends the authentication to, look to a validation on the DC. How does Kerberos being triggered? So any logon to a Windows machine triggers Kerberos as long as Kerberos works on that workstation. If not, maybe because of the port is closed, then there will be a fallback to NTLM. Both Kerberos and NTLM can also be triggered by the directory or dir command from CMD. While for Kerberos, we would use the DNS name of the resource. In NTLM, we will use the related IP address um, to, the same, to the same resource. Regarding the versions, in Kerberos, we always use Kerberos v5 as the last, latest, and this is the one that used in Windows machines. And for NTLM, we'll see NTLM version 1 and NTLM version 2. And with that, we come to the NTLM uh, flow, and we'll remind again that NTLM is an authentication and authorization protocol. Um, it's a good point to mention that NTLM version 1 is less, in, less secure than the version 2, which has better security mechanisms and can seal and sign the, uh, the traffic that comes after the authentication. Okay, let's understand how the, the flow of NTLM really works. Once the user entered its uh, password, in this example, it was a 1234, this um, password is translated into RC4 hash that um, holds in the ELSA space memory, memory space. And now the user can use it to negotiate a server. So in the first packet will be, hello server, I want to authenticate in front of you. The server would um, respond with a challenge, a four byte challenge, that now the user needs to use the cipher, the client needs to use the cipher to encrypt this challenge and reply with a response. The server gets the response as is, send it to the domain controller with the relevant user and the challenge. 
what the domain controller would do is find the um, pair of that uh, user, uh, the key of that user. The, it will it will find the same cipher and will try to decrypt the response. If the response decrypted successfully and what the DC finds is the same challenge as the server sent um, in the in, in the second um, phase, then the domain controller will return a successful authentication and will also mention uh, the authorization information relevant to this ser uh, this user. Now the server gets both. The server decides whether to allow the specific user to use the, the resources on that server. Okay, so this, that, that was NTLM flow, and it's a good 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 way, uh, good point to mention NTLM relay attack. This is one of the uh, most known attacks on NTLM. It is known since 2000, and some of you know it by the name of SMB relay. In this attack, the attacker uh, would like to access a resource in the environment that it doesn't has have uh, it doesn't have permissions to. The goal of the attack is to impersonate the victim user, the one we see on the left side, who has permission to access a sensitive server like that on the right, right side. Um, because NTLM is vulnerable to man in the middle attack, the vulnerability is much less common to exploit with NTLM version two. But as NTLM version one still in use in some environment, let's do go over the attack. So the attacker would try to get the encrypted NTLM challenge by becoming man in the middle between the user and the server. Just in the middle, we see the attacker in red. The first, red, uh, the first phase is to trick the user to establish an NTLM connection to the attacker's device. The attackers take the, um, the uh, authentication in front of the server and wait for the challenge the server reply. Now the attacker copies the same challenge to the user. The user now have to sign this challenge with its own cipher. It, it does it and returns the, the encrypted challenge, aka the response, to the attacker. Now the attacker relay or copy this um, response to the server and the server validates the, the, the um, response with the DC and replies to the attacker authentication okay. Um, over here, for those of you who, who missed me, I'm over here, authentication okay. Now the attacker needs to decide what to answer the user. It can answer with both authentication fail or just ignore any TCP connection from that user from now on and can have a impersonated session in front of the server. Now the attacker um, used the user and the server thinks this is the user who talks to and access to this server. The challenge, okay. Um, regarding the challenge, um, maybe we can um, go back. Someone asked me about the, what is the challenge? So the server just uh, generates eight bytes of um, gen, uh, random hash that the, the user needs to encrypt, okay? It can be um, even one, two, three, four, a um, few times, um, and as long as it's eight bytes. Um, okay. Great. On uh, last January, we've seen Brave Exchange that was published and exposed vulnerability in the Exchange servers. The, ex the exploit shows that any domain user can force an Exchange server to trigger the NTLM authentication to their IP. Okay, the, the, the attackers having an IP and triggers the Exchange in the domain to authenticate in front of them. This allows exploiting the Exchange server account using the NTLM relay we just saw. In front of us, we see the um, security alert that Azure ATP now detects um, this kind of attack. Um, we see on the left side at the Exchange server, 
that tries and thinks that it talks to a VPN DC, but it really talks to the middleman in this IP who is not um, familiar as the exchange server. And this is the reason Azure ATP triggered this kind of alert. Okay, moving on to Kerberos. I hope you are still with me. Um, Kerberos is another authentication and authorization protocol. It is well known in, in Windows machines and as default in any Windows. Um, if we talk about the same WASA1234 um, password, now in Elsas, Elsas stores both the ciphers re related to a password and we'll see in a minute tickets of Kerberos. Um, so this is the Elsas uh, memory space where the WASA123 is, is stored in four kinds of um, ciphers where the strongest is AES256 and the weakest is RC4. When a user wants to um, authenticate, it tries to authenticate in front of a KDC um, on the domain controller. The KDC is a key distribution, distribution center who holds a copy of these ciphers. Okay, so first the, the user needs to authenticate uh, in their organization and the user sends in one an AS request authentication service request, which includes an encrypted timestamp. It is recommend, uh, recommended that the encryption would be, as I mentioned, a, with AES256. If the KDC succeeds to decrypt the request and validates the timestamp, it will reply with AES reply contains a ticket running ticket, what we call TGT. This one over here. Um, this TGT is encrypted with a special um, Curve TGT account. The whole process here is based on this um, sensitive account who the KDC is the only one who should have access to. Um, please remember that this TGT is encrypted with a Curve TGT as we'll mention it um, in a few more minutes when we speak about the golden ticket attack. Okay, moving on. Now the, the user has the TGT in this uh, Elsa's uh, memory space and it can perform the TGS request to the same KDC or to another one in the domain. Um, using this uh, TGT, the user uh, shows the KDC. Hi, this is my uh, um, TGT. Please allow me to access uh, further server or service let's say the user wants to access an exchange service so the user will mention that it tries to get to the exchange service and will show the tgt if the kdc can decrypt the tgt and validate the user it will generate a new tgs ticket running service that will be stored now in the elsa's memory space of the user the user or the client now can use this TGS to um, access the server. In our case, it would be the um, exchange service. Um, I do want to manage, mention that both TGT and TGS include a group list, a security group, group list that helps the server determine whether the um, client, the user that now tries to get access to, has permission on that server. Okay, now that we already know how NTLM and Kerberos work, or basically work, <laughs> let's look on how attackers exploit both of them. Attackers will try to find accounts um, existing domain and get their password. The first phase would call um, account enumeration, and the second brute force. Both NTLM and Kerberos have different um, error codes for failed authentication, which disclose the reason of failure. If the account is not in domain, for example, Kerberos will return the relevant non-existing account error. Therefore, the attackers who get this error can use this data to map existing accounts and non-existing accounts in the domain. 
Um, they can try out guessing common accounts or known employees and, vet and find those who existing. For example, in the security alert of Azure ATP in front of us, we can see that on the left side, um, the attack shows the existing accounts that were enumerated, and on the right side, the non-existing account. 101 um, failed attempts to find relevant user in the domain. But once they find this uh, one existing account, they can start brute forcing and look for relevant and successful authentication with any kind of password they guess. So Azure ADP, as mentioned, detects both scenarios. And with that, I'm um, uh, giving the mic to Andrew, who will show it in a live demo. Hello, uh, I'm Andrew Harris, a principal program manager on our uh, uh, Azure ATP side. Uh, hopefully everyone can see the screen and I'll zoom in uh, when uh, when necessary, uh, but this will probably be a pretty quick uh, demo. We're going to show the brute force. Um, so now that we have um, some context of Kerberos, some context of NCLM, um, the differences between those protocols, let's actually execute one of those attacks. Um, so you can see in my screen, I have a whole bunch of VMs uh, in an environment. Uh, I'm just using an RDP manager uh, tool to just easily access these resources. Um, you can also see I have staged uh, batch file scripts just to make sure I don't fat finger anything during this demo. Um, here is the batch script, the first one. It's going to be a brute force Kerberos attack. Um, you can see we're going to use, let me zoom in for you, uh, a text field for both the SAM account names as well as a password file. Um, so let me just zoom out. This is the account names, and I'll show you that shortly. I'll sh uh, I won't show you the password file just because uh, in Hydra, you, there's some bad uh, bad names. We don't want to show any uh, foul language. Um, but again, if you're familiar with Kali Linux, if you're familiar with Hydra, if you're familiar with NCRAC and so forth, uh, it is pretty arbitrary to just harvest the most known and used passwords in the wild, and that's where you start guessing uh, all of these. So we're actually going to be doing both a uh, horizontal as well as vertical brute force attack against um, our domain that we have staged here uh, in this in this example. Um, here you see all the accounts we're actually going to be doing an attack against. Again, a lot of them do not exist, as Kyle just mentioned before. Azure ATP, again, from an instrument response perspective, does care and does want to tell you, hey, um, these accounts uh, were not successfully brute forced and hey, these accounts don't exist. Uh, again, from an investigation perspective, that is um, super important information to know when the attacker is not just successful, but also when they're um, attempting to get into your environment. Um, so let's actually run this attack. Again, this is going to be a pretty quick demo uh, and you'll see just how scary real brute force attacks uh, are. I'm just going to give this a double click. I'll zoom in. Actually, it might not uh, load live as it starts going if I zoom in. Uh, and again, behind the scenes, this is just trying to uh, go through all the iterations of usernames and passwords. Uh, and if it sees a username that actually exists, it will try um, up to 100 passwords before jumping to the next one. Uh, and again, if you're familiar with Hydra, um, this is kind of a custom built in uh, custom tool that we built just for demo purposes. Let me just give this a little enter. Um, so you can already see that I found um, two passwords in really quick amount of time. Again, obviously we stage this environment, uh, but you can see, uh, oops, uh, Julian I, as well as Ron HD were actually hacked just now. Uh, and we can see their respective passwords. Um, so that's really it from a Kerberos um, uh, perspective. I could have done the exact same thing with NTLM. Uh, and now as the attacker, I now know usernames that actually exist and what's worse, um, their respective plain text passwords, uh, which we'll show you shortly. Uh, Tal, back to you. Thanks, Andrew. Wait a second. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thanks Andrew again. And before we move to the next attacks, we need to get known with the term of harvesting. 
in order to get known with uh, uh, Kerberos tickets uh, of another user, they need, we need to stall them, or the attackers need to stall the tickets from another machine. But how? First, the attackers need to find a local admin on the target machine. This can be done by enumerating local accounts using PowerSploit. PowerSploit is an open uh, source tool that anyone can find. And what it does, it looks for the sum account who stores the local accounts on a machine and enumerate what uh, user have who, uh, what user have um, local admin rights. So once the attackers find this kind of uh, user, they can um, and, um, connect to the machine and start dumping the, um, the ELSAS memory space, as we mentioned before. They can do it with Mimikatz, which is also an, an open space, an open source um, tool that allows to both um, dump the ciphers and Kerberos tickets from the memory. So using this uh, local admin, um, it is possible to dump the Kerberos tickets in Elsas and copy them. And we are going to see this in a demonstration in the story of uh, pass the ticket. So in our story here, Ron HD is a member of a help desk uh, group who has local admins right on the admin PC. Um, on that machine, Samira, who is a domain admin in, the domain, in this domain, has a, a log on session. So when Ron tries to log on using its uh, local admin rights, it finds Samira's ticket in Elsas and it dumps it and copies the, the file he just dumped into uh, a folder to his own victim machine um, where he has access to. Now he can impersonate Samira in order to get to the DC. So with the past the ticket, what we actually do here is ladder of movement um, and impersonation because Ron did not have enough um, permissions to access the DC, but he's told Samira's uh, ticket to do so. Now the DC is pwned by uh, Ron and let's understand what is the meaning of having a pwned DC in the domain. Okay, let's, back, let's get back to the Kerberos flow. The attacker has uh, Samira's account, so they use it to access the DC. Once the DC um, is, um, is pwned, they can harvest the CurbTGT account we mentioned before and copy this CurbTGT account with the password to um, Ron's um, Elvis memory, memory space. And now, from now on, Ron can create its own ticket running tickets without requesting them from the KDC. Therefore, there is no need to use any AS request, which is the um, authentication service request, the phase of authentication in front of the KDC, the key distribution center, because Ron has the curve GT, um, on his machine in his um, memory space. Um, what Ron is going to do with uh, this curve GDT, it, it will try to create a backdoor uh, account or ticket with uh, any kind of permission Ron's want. And also this uh, backdoor account can be um, for lifetime, um, uh, li valid for lifetime, or it can have um, uh, better permissions, as I mentioned. Okay, so what Ron is actually doing is using this KerbTGT account in order to create a backdoor TGT. It uh, takes a, um, an object, it folds it with the relevant information he wants to, um, to have as a TGT and encrypts the TGT with that password of KerbTGT. Now, Ron sends this um, TGT to grant further permissions and TGS, for example, to other DCs in the domain. Why? Because Ron impersonated Samira and then uh, got the first uh, time to the domain controller, where there he finds the curve TGT account. 
this attack of um, stealing the code GDT from the KDC and the DC and creating a ticket running ticket is called golden ticket attack. And I'm moving back the mic to Andrew, who will show it again in a demo. Thank you. Let me share my screen again. Um, before we move on to that section, I just want to close out the brute force. Um, so Tyler already showed a, a slide showing the actual detection, um, but not only are we detecting the brute force, and let me just zoom in, um, not only are we detecting the brute force um, from the res respective victim PC2, again, we're showing you all the resources they did this attack against, um, but most importantly is the evidence below. Um, so you can actually see what attacks, uh, which accounts were used, uh, as well as who actually was successfully logged on. As you saw earlier, I actually brute forced uh, multiple accounts successfully. Um, let me zoom out, do it the right way, and actually give this guy a click right here. That will actually show what did the attacker just gain access to. Um, he gained access to both Ron Helpdesk as well as Jun uh, Julian Isla. From a investigation perspective, I can quickly jump to one of these objects in Azure ATP, let me zoom out and actually go to see everything else that's going on with that particular user. So again, from an investigation perspective, we're not just trying to say um, what's good, what's bad. We're giving you evidence uh, and do back to the evidence page. We're also showing you evidence on why we believe this is actually a true positive. Um, so for example, you can see none of the passwords that we attempted were previously used passwords for those accounts. Uh, if that was the case, we would we would um, make that evidence here. You, it potentially would go to your investigation team. And they'd say, hey, um, maybe, you know, Ron HD just simply forgot his previous. Uh, he was using his old password. And again, it helps you identify in triage. Are these false positives? Are these true benign positives or are all these true positives? So now that we close out the brute force, let me just go back to this page and let's actually show back our VMs. Um, so now we have access to Ron HD. I just want to do a quick, uh, couple things quick, um, and let's just enumerate who is Ron HD. Um, so far, you heard about this guy, but we don't really know too much information about him. I just did a quick net user, uh, and let me uh, zoom in again. Uh, I did a net user domain account. Any authenticated user and domain can do this, and we're essentially learning who is Ron HD. Uh, and you could see he's also a member of the help desk group. Um, so again, from an attacker perspective, we don't exactly know what that means. I'll show you a little bit more shortly uh, on how to actually use this information. We're going to now do a run as command. Um, it's not, let me just show you the script. It's very simple. It's just like any other run as that you're used to. I am just saying, hey, let me run a process, in this case, CMD or the command um, that exe console, uh, and I want to act as contoso.ronhd, uh, the person we literally just now have the clear text password for. So I'm going to give that a click. It's going to open up another command window. Again, nothing too crazy yet. We already know the password from the previous exercise. Now, if I do who am I, this is showing us that we are Ron HD. Again, nothing too crazy yet, um, but let me just do a quick um, remote SAMR uh, against this guy. Um, so let me uh, just do PowerShell. And I'm going to use PowerSploit real quick just to see, does this user have admin rights to a machine before we even attempt to use it? Um, so I'm just importing the PowerShell um, uh, code. Let me kick it off. Uh, so all I did is import PowerSploit, and I'm just doing a get net local group. Any authenticated user by default um, can actually run this. And essentially, we're knocking on admin PC and saying, hey, who are your local admins uh, on that machine? Once this finishes, we should see that Ron HD, because he's a member of Helpdesk, and because Helpdesk is an administrator of admin PC, we are uh, good to go and we can actually use this account to do pass the ticket uh, as Tal just uh, discussed. Takes about uh, 15 seconds sometimes just with network. And I'll get the next stage started. Do, do, do. As that continues, 
Um, I'm, I'll talk about the next phase. Essentially, we're going to show that we have legitimate access to admin PC with Ron HD's account. I'm then going to copy over Mimikatz, use Mimikatz to harvest all those tickets in memory in that LSAS.exe process uh, talked about earlier. Uh, and again, that just completed. So I can actually see that Ron, uh, I can see that help desk is a member of admin PC. So I now know that Ron HD has legitimate admin privileges um, to that computer. So what I'm going to do now is again, copy Mimikatz over to the machine, run Mimikatz, telling it to compromise all the tickets uh, or harvest all the tickets, export them to disk, and I'm then going to X copy those back to my victim PC so I then can use them. I'll then remove uh, from the directory of admin PC all the, the tickets I just exported. Uh, so essentially, if a uh, defender was there, they would have no idea that I actually ever hit this. Again, we are trying to be very noisy. Um, we did turn off Windows Defender uh, and any antivirus, um, but this is uh, you're, it, you are, it is possible to evade antivirus. Uh, we're just choosing not to do that. So we are attempting to be very noisy for demonstration purposes. Um, so let me run these commands. Let me just prove that I can actually access. Well, actually, let me exit PowerShell first. We just have access to the C drive of admin PC. Only admin should be able to do that. Again, I'm just proving that Ron HD has legitimate access to the admin PC. Now let's actually copy Mimikatz over. Just do copy paste. That's going to be a directory. I'm going to then use power uh, sys internals oops, to actually kick off Mimikatz, export the tickets, and I'll stage this one to move it back. So again, all Mimikatz is doing, uh, again, it is compromising or harvesting the credentials in LSAS, uh, in this case tickets in LSAS process in the very next command, I will be X copying them back. Um, you'll notice, by the way, I'm only copying back the ones that say Samira A with the curb TGT. Um, so there's a lot of tickets that are gonna be in the LSAS process. Some are the ones I don't care about. Actually, most of them I do not care about. All I really care about are ones that are titled Samira, the person I wanna harvest, because I know she's a domain admin, and I want to uh, harvest the ones that say curb TGT because I know they actually are her TGT. They are her. Um, if I steal those, I can access or request access to any other resource. I can go back to the DC and say, hey, look, this is a legitimate Samir A ticket. Give me access to whatever resource um, that Samir A, uh, Samir A has legitimate access to. So let me go ahead and do that. I'm going to copy them back. Now have all those tickets and let me just remove any tracks that I was ever on that machine. Uh, that admin PC. Done. So now I am done with Ron HD. I already have harvested now the tickets of Samira A. Uh, there's no reason for me to ever really use Ron HD. I just properly domain escalated um, to a, a d domain admin for all intents and purposes. Let me, before I show you this, before I run it, let me just show you what's happening. Uh, we, again, I scripted something that's just going to take Mimi Cats and literally pass the tickets. So again, I've already harvested the tickets from admin PC. I moved them back down to our victim PC where I am right now, and I'm going to now pass the ticket. I'm going to load those tickets in memory using Mimikatz uh, so I can actually masquerade uh, and use legitimate uh, tickets uh, that I just harvested. Uh, just to show you where these are on disk, so you know there's no special crazy voodoo, uh, let me just go back to my temp folder. And in admin PC tickets where I put these tickets, you can see I do have one ticket. So let me just give this a, a double click. Oops. You can see I'm Jeff L. I now just harvested the credentials. I just ran um, Mimikatz. I loaded the, oops, it looks like it has a error. <laughs> Let me uh, just do that real quick one more time and make sure I'm logged in as Samira A. Der. Just to make sure there's a ticket on there. I might have harvested a bad ticket. So again, I'll just do the last part real quick again. Two, two, two. Fighting Tigers. Helps if I get the right password. Again, I'm just going to copy over Mimikatz. Do do. 
directory, gonna launch it. Let me just delete anything in my temp folder real quick. So you know this is a real doubt live demo. And of course, crazy things happen. Just wait a minute. See all the tickets coming in being exported to disk. Let's copy them back. All right, sweet. So I have more tickets now. So something I just messed up something earlier, uh, but you see there's three legitimate curb TGT signed tickets, TGTs. Again, these are the identity of Samir A. I'm just going to again point to this folder. I just put these tickets on. I'm just going to skip the deletion part for now. I don't save. Too many things open right now. To do. And I'm going to pass the ticket. Again, I'm showing you that I can't, I don't have legitimate access to Contoso DC right now. I haven't actually passed the ticket. All I did is harvest the credentials. Um, so that's what I'm showing you right now. The access is denied. I cannot access Contoso DC's C uh, drive. I have nothing in my K list. I never actually uh, imported the tickets yet. As you can see right here, uh, there are no tickets. I'm now going to actually run it and you can see it actually ran properly this time. I just ran Kerberos PTT uh, in again, Mimikatz, and I now have two loaded tickets in my current LSAS process. Let me just zoom out. Uh, you can see a K list. Again, I ran K list right here, again in the script. And now instead of having it being empty, I properly injected Samira A's tickets in memory. Uh, so it's probably a good thing you saw a little foobar on my part. Uh, you do know this is a real live uh, environment. So now I have our tickets. Uh, great. How do I? It could be game over if I just do this. Again, I just did a dir contoso DC. Earlier I showed you I did not have access to it. I now just imported her tickets. I now have legitimate access as Samira A against Contoso DC. She is our domain admin. All intents and purposes, it's pretty much game over. This is domain compromise. I didn't have to exploit the domain controller or exploit an active directory vulnerability. I just had to harvest a credential of the domain admin uh, where they are actually located, in this case, admin PC. Now let's actually uh, uh, go back and actually put a backdoor uh, in place, as uh, Tal mentioned. Uh, we're going to skip um, actually doing the what's known as the DC uh, replication. That's actually where we get the curb TGT account. Uh, but do know once I'm Samir A, I can replicate that. We will have a future webinar. We will actually go into detail more about that uh, entire area. Uh, but just make the assumption that I've already harvested, just like I've harvested other credentials already, using Samir A's credential, uh, make the assumption I use her credential to harvest curb TGT. I'm going to now, again, skip that step and jump straight to uh, the golden ticket. Uh, just to show you, since we have a little bit of time, where that actually is, if I go to domain dominance, oops, if I go back to my temp folder, you can see I've actually already harvested it. Uh, right there, uh, this is the actual account. As you can see, the SAM account name says, let me fix that so I can actually highlight the stuff. Curb TGT is the user, and I have access to their legitimate NTLM hash. That's all I need. I can masquerade um, and sign and create my own TGTs as if I was the domain controller. And because Kerberos is symmetric encryption, again, this is the master key for me to again sign uh, and tell people they're part of any member, which I'll shortly show you as well. So let's go back to the webinar scripts I created for you. We're going to skip the Jeff L ones just to kind of sh show uh, what we're doing with Sumer A. Let me just actually log off and log back on. Sometimes uh, if I do a K-list purge, it doesn't actually take place, but let's just try. I just try to remove the K-list, all the Kerberos things in my LSAS process, just so I can create another Samir A1 and show I have legitimate access. Just so again, you know, I, I'm not doing anything staging. This is all real, oops. I still have legitimate access. Let me just log off the user so I know I am no longer that person flushing the LSAS process, flushing uh, all credentials in memory. I'll log back on. And again, I already have Samir A's credentials. I'm done with all the other users you saw me uh, talk to. Let's go back to webinar, golden ticket. And what I'm going to do is, again, use Mimikatz. I'm going to, I'm going to use the harvested ticket 
the curb TGT, the one I just showed you earlier. I'm also going to use a SID, as you can see here. This is the SID of the domain, and I'll show you exactly how to get that. And I'm also going to say I am Samira A. So when I say when Tal says backdoor, I don't legitimately even have to own Samira A's computer anymore. I don't have to reharvest it. I can just generate now my own tickets for any user uh, at any time, adding them to any security group uh, as as well. So here you can see 512, 513, 518. We're just putting them in the, the typical domain admins, enterprise admins, um, those kind of security groups. I could have put this person into a security group like help desk that has admin access just to the DCs. I could have put it into a security group that maybe your CXOs exist in who have access to highly privileged data as long as they are a member of a particular security group. And so from demo purposes, we're just showing you we're stuffing the groups here. Uh, and again, I'm just going to pass her ID, which is 1103. She is that user ID in uh, this forest. Once I create that, again, I'm doing. I'm just showing you the stages. I can actually export this ticket, and that's exactly what I'm doing here. I'm saying, hey, export this ticket to disk so I can actually use it in the future. I can use this tomorrow. I can use it uh, four years from now. Uh, as long as that curb TGT, as long as this guy is properly uh, the same value, uh, I can keep signing tickets as if I was, again, the DC itself. Uh, here you see me actually using that ticket that I uh, am writing to disk and actually doing exactly what I did earlier, pass the ticket and actually going to create uh, and actually stuff my LSAS process with this now made up backdoor Samir A uh, credential. So I'll stop talking and I'll do more showing. Let me just show you legitimately, I do not have access to Contoso DC. Again, access is denied. That's what I want you to see. I'm not doing, again, I'm not staging anything. This is a real live attack. I'm going to now double click this guy. Um, so when I said I needed the SID ID to do golden ticket attack, I could just do a who am I user and actually just take this value. That is the SID for our domain. Uh, and you saw that earlier in the in the batch script. Uh, so this is for Jeff L. He's got a value of 1106. Samir A, she had a value of 1103. Um, so I just used her real value uh, when I'm generating this ticket shortly that you'll see. Here you see me use this ticket. Again, we talked about this already, uh, but you can see everything worked well. I generated the pack. I, I, again, not talking at all to the DC at this point. I am literally acting as the DC and literally just created a TGT uh, for Samir A for all the values um, I just told it to, to put in. Now it's time to actually use it. Again, I'm just exiting Mimikatz. Now let's actually use. And again, I now have legitimate access as Samir A with a backdoor credential um, as Samir A to access Contoso DC. So even if you were able to reset Contoso DC, me having that curb TGT account, I can become anyone at any time masquerading as the domain controller until that TGT or that hash is actually changed, until you actually change the curb TGT um, account itself. Tally, tally. Uh, actually, let me show you back now the actual detections. So here you can see the actual pass the ticket. I actually was, um, Azure ATP was actually able to detect um, Samir A's ticket which was taken from admin PC. Again, if you remember, I did that as Ron HD after doing the brute force. I then moved it to victim PC and you can see it says end used on. Uh, and I was able to access three additional resources during that. So let me actually do this properly again. You can actually see the resources actually accessed. In this case, I'm only accessing the DC again to well access the domain controller. I was actually accessing its um, C share, if you remember, that's the SIFS service. Um, so that's exactly what this is right here. Uh, and you can also see exactly which IP I just came from. Um, and you can also see uh, where Samir A's credentials are exposed to. Sometimes these investigations are not so straightforward. Sometimes you have to figure out, hey, where else Where else did Samir A potentially um, expose her credentials so it actually could be harvested and then used in a pass the ticket attack. Um, well, let me dump uh, drive into that real quick. Let me zoom out. Oops. My screen is uh, going a little crazy. Reload the page. Oh. 
let me just reload that. I think that was a edge error. So CXP Ninja, that is our workspace. I'm gonna go back to Sumer A's page and show you exactly what it looks like. Again, you can see she has paths. That means we've detected where she had uh, credential exposure to. And here's all the places Sumir A exposed her credential to in the last uh, two days. Say, again, I am a, a, a SOC, a security operations center. I'm just being completely flooded with alerts. Uh, and maybe I don't realize Samira A actually got compromised until, you know, six months later, which is actually, unfortunately, the typical use case we see. Uh, you can actually now go into a specific date and see Samira A's credential exposure at a given point. So you know, I'll go back to March 12th uh, and I can actually see what her expen uh, credential exposure was at that particular time. Um, so again, very powerful capability for Azure ATP. We did detect the past the ticket. We detected the, the uh, brute force. We also detected the golden ticket. Um, so here you can see Samira A was actually uh, generated. A fake ticket was generated on victim PC. It looked anomalous from the rest of the other tickets we've seen on her behalf. Uh, and again, it was actually used to re access for other resources as we talked earlier. Um, so Azure ATP not only is the, doing the detections, it's also providing you with the lateral movement graph where was credential exposure occurring. And we're giving you also evidence um, such as hey, these tickets were never really um, observed from this user before, uh, the IP addresses and what actual resources were used after we've detected the anomalous behavior. Talantali, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, so uh, what we did today, we learned what is, uh, how Kerberos and NTLM work. We talked about all these uh, attacks and we demonstrated most of it uh, thanks to Andrew. We talked about NTLM relay attack, brute force attack, pass the ticket and golden ticket. As you can see here, Azure ATP has five flavors, uh, different flavors of golden ticket attack. We demonstrated one uh, in Azure ATP console, but you you have uh, more coverage and protection. And inside this uh, slide, you will have a link to the relevant documentation, which will help you better understand the attack and suggest a recommendation on how to investigate the alerts. Here you can find additional resources if you would like to to learn more about Kerberos, about uh, Azure ATP detections, you will find the, the Azure ATP attack simulation playbook, and we are welcoming you to join our Azure ATP community on the tech community, which you can talk directly to us. Here you have a link to the feedback for this webinar. We'll be very happy if you can share with us the feedback, tell us what was good and what was uh, not that good that we can uh, improve ourselves to the upcoming webinar. Brian, back to you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so I think we've got time for just a couple questions here before we um, close up. One of them was how do we prevent, how can someone prevent against these type of attacks? Uh, is there any DC hardening that's effective or any of those sorts of approaches? So Andrew, did you want to take that one? Because I think we've seen some similar questions where people have said if um, the if I use MFA for all my identities, am I completely protected? Is there any complete protection or are there some suggestions that we can give people in addition to the detections that Azure ATP gives them to help them show what's going on? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we worked with um, our peers and counterparts in Azure AD, as well as a group called internal to Microsoft, the um, cybersecurity solutions group uh, and there's something called a secure privileged access roadmap a spa roadmap it's aka.ms forward slash spa roadmap um, that actually gives you a good detail um, a, amount of information on how to create a 30-day plan a 60-day plan uh, and a 180-day uh, plan um, so our goal for azure atp is to give you immediate 
visibility of what actually is going on in your environment, whether you're seeing anomalous things, where you're seeing even um, some of the simpler stuff like LDAP simple bind, where a domain admin might be exposing their credential on the wire. Um, and again, it's not as as cool as what we just showed you with the golden ticket, but certainly very important to, to be aware of. Um, there's other recommendations in that SPA roadmap that talk about how do you lower your credential hygiene and again, Azure DP is playing a very crucial role in there as well, where we're doing detections, we're measuring exposure dynamically at log on time um, and actually building that entire tree of, hey, if you compromise person A, it can map to um, these escalated privileges. Um, and again, there's an entire process of, process of how you use group policy objects to make sure your domain admins are, are not egregiously ex exposing their accounts to machines they shouldn't be. Um, so going back to the least privilege access control kind of model, um, don't use an account unless you absolutely need those privileges and don't expose highly privileged users um, to lower, less trusted devices. And that, at the end of the day, that's really ultimately what it comes down to. So absolutely, yes, use multi-factor authentication um, for users who are still using smart card required interactive logon, keep doing that. Um, but do know the second you authenticate to a device, is the second that device is exposed to that user and that is the second if that machine is compromised that the adversary has the ability to harvest those credentials um, so in our in our use case for example uh, it would have been game over still even if i use smart card re uh, required interactive logon in our past the ticket again we've already authenticated so skrill in theory already got um, completed uh, and the adversary would literally would not care less um, if smart card required interactive logon was necessary for that particular user. Now, if they were to access a resource that was behind a web application firewall, or if they were going to access a resource in Azure, then absolutely multi-factor authentication would uh, essentially, hopefully find that anomalous activity. And that's what we're driving to in the V next version of Azure ATP with Azure ED. Um, and it will actually force them to do a multi-factor authentication logon. Um, so the AK.MS that's SPA roadmap, SPA roadmap, um, is probably the best resource to see that full picture of how do you not just detect, uh, but also to lower your hygiene and actually start protecting. Excellent, thank you for that, Andrew. We've just got a couple minutes here, so I'm gonna remind everyone of a few links here. If you wanna get to the recordings of this webinar, uh, go to aka.ms slash AATP recordings. And um, as the folks mentioned earlier on the call, we plan on doing a series on this, although we don't have details yet on the next one, but um, stay tuned on our community there and you'll see further ones there and all the, the future recordings will be posted there as well. If we did not get to your question or if you were watching this after the fact as a recording, uh, please go to aka.ms slash Azure ATP community. That'll take you to our Azure ATP group on a tech community where you can ask questions and we will be happy to address them there. While you are there, of course, join our larger security community. So Azure ATP is only one product in a group of several that are all security related and we've got them grouped together and listed there. And then uh, of course, we would love to hear your feedback and the link for that is aka.ms AATP webinar feedback. So, I want to thank uh, all the people who helped answer questions today, Astrid, Jason, Yohan, Yossi, um, and of course our presenters, Tal, Tali, and Andrew. Most of all, I want to thank all of you for joining us and for being part of our community. We will announce future webinars on our community and we hope you will join us next time. Thank you.